And then we get stampeded to some program and start to whip ourselves or try to do something or else just submit in resignation to the end and dissolution of our congregation, right? Well, and, and how many congregational members are, are ready to submit because right. they, they see the task as being too great? And what's the difference here? What does Bonhoeffer say? There's hope. There's hope. Be the church. Maybe this is a good chance for us to be the church instead of trying to, uh, you know, trying to be the, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's very ho- hope- helpful for me what Charles Taylor says in, in a secular age uh, about the age that we're just coming out of with regard to the church. It's called the age of mobilization. In other words, we had all these mobilizations for evangelism, mobilizations for world mission, mobilize the congregation to do this ministry and that ministry, um, and uh, you know, organize, program. Uh, and uh, that was the church's response to modernity in the early, now, and now we're living in the age, and, and uh, we're now living in the age of, of authenticity in which every, uh, the, the imperative is not to mobilize to do good or whatever. The imperative is I have to live in a way that's authentic to me. And now the church switches gears and tries to cater to that. And how about, let's, let's try being the church instead of either one. Let's try being the church. That's what he's saying here. We stick to our task and then we suffer we preach the gospel and we suffer Mm-hmm. And now they, they look around their congregations and say, well, how many of us are, are cotton tops? How many of us can't do anything anymore? Yeah. And have a statement like this saying, you, this is the group that's going to revitalize Christianity. How? How do we do that? We're, we're, how do we reach to the, the 20-some-year-old family with, with that are in their music? Well, you know, let me, let me interpose here because we're moving. This is one point in Bonhoeffer here. And what you're saying here, Mike, is that, listen, all those people out there, they're not running to the church, <laughs> right? Including those who would look like to find justice, truth, science, art, culture, all the good things they'd like to stand up for, they'd like to recover, they're not coming to the church. They do, and they're not coming to the church. We got to move on, because that's not where Bonhoeffer stays. Okay. okay? This was one moment where he was kind of astonished to see some kind of coming to him at this moment. But why did they come to him? You know? Well, where, what if he had stayed? It, what? I'm sorry, go ahead. He was in that 
Right, and he was he 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 was he 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 threw himself into this very risky, dangerous, guilty business with them, and that's why they came to him. But let's 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 hold that thought, okay? Because we're going to move in in, in that direction later. Um, we got to talk about the church's effort to preserve itself in the face of the world come of age, and he is very critical of the church here. Um, we're back in the letters and papers now. Um, the, the church's reaction to the world come of age has been largely defensive. Both Protestants and Catholics regard this as a, as, uh, as, as, um, a great falling away. Uh, that, that is, the, the world living out without the working hypothesis of God. And so the church has traditionally aligned itself against the world come of age and trying to persuade modern people that they still need God. And we haven't been very successful, have we? <laughs> and he says why. Um, first, uh, this is an apolo- this is a, the, the, the basic theological error here is confusing the religious garment of, Christian, of the gospel with the gospel itself. It's built on this religious garb that Christianity has taken and for the last, since the beginning, is built on a so-called religious a priori, which is the assumption that hum- humans have an inborn need for God, which then religion satisfies. And in this understanding, Christian, Christianity is one form, perhaps the true form, of a universally human phenomenon. So the procedure then is to uncover people's needs, to get people to admit to this need, and then to admit that only we have the right solution to your need in our religion, right? So that's what we've been trying to do. That's the formula of every revival. It is, right. So this, the religious interpretation of Christianity begins not with Christ, but with a human idea of the world and a human idea of God, right? As we talked about before. So God, by definition, exists at the limit of human strength and knowledge. He is what we are not. We're weak, he's strong. We are finite, he's infinite. We are sinful, he is good, and so on. And we can't live without God. We have unsolvable problems like guilt and death. Only God has the answers for them. So we need to turn to him. We need to turn to God now and submit to him in order to find those solutions to our problems. And as Bonhoeffer says, that turns the gospel into a law, the demand that we do something. So where do you see that happening today, this religious apologetic? Do you see that? We talked about every revival is based on this. Although in and with it, there's the gospel somewhere, sometimes in there. You know, it's not that... It only makes hypocrites. There, it does, does make Christians because, after all, the word is there. All the therapeutic ways of, you know, trying to entice people into the church, telling people that they really need God to solve their problems. Um, Most of our evangelism programs, you can't get along without God. You got to have God because you're just too weak, too ineffective. But then they turn around and say, but it's up to you to appropriate this and make this yours, you know. It's really in the end up to you. So it's kind of ironic, you know. (laughs) You're needy and weak, but well, all you have to do is say yes, you know. You have to open your heart to him, right? So um, it's legalistic, and we all can think of that. You know, decision theology is the essence of it, uh, but it's there in the self-help groups. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's there when people say, you know, unless you have religion, you can't be moral, um, and so on. 
Well, he has a threefold critique of this. First of all, that it's pointless. It just doesn't work. You can't bring an adult back into puberty. That is to make people dependent on a lot of things in, on which they in fact no longer depend and to shove them into problems that are in fact no longer problems for them. As he repeats, people really don't need God in order to face life. Many people face life very, very admirably without God. And they can't be induced to submit to dependence on the church or any other religious authority. They just won't. Now the God of the gaps who supposedly lives where our own strength and knowledge fail us is constantly in retreat um, because... uh, As we become stronger, as our knowledge increases, the need for God decreases. It's a losing game until finally God is so really quite irrelevant to anything. In the dispute between the church and the world, this apologetic quote allows the world the right to assign to Christ his place within it. You know, this is the old apologetic that says we have to uncover the problem in human existence and then show how the gospel is the solution to it. And that means that we dictate (laughs) what Christ's place in the world is going to be. It's the shape of my problem, whatever it is. He says that liberal theology had the merit of taking the world in its maturity seriously, but it accepted the peace terms dictated to it by the world and so failed to preserve the gospel. And the same is true of those who tried to start over with the Bible and the Reformation in the 20th century. For example, Boltmann, who tried to accommodate the gospel into a modern worldview and ended up losing the substance of the gospel. I won't go into that, but we could talk about that. He even really uh, criticized Karl Barth for so-called positivism of revelation, which basically says, here it is, my 13 volumes so far that I got done before I died, and uh, you know, here it is. Like it or leave it, or lump it. (laughs) That doesn't get us very far with modern people. Take the whole system. This is the revelation that's come from God. Okay. Um, I won't go into that. Let's, Let's go on ahead to the second one. We won't talk, we won't stay and talk about Bart. Um, The religious apologetic is ignoble. It's morally wrong. We're on page 14, number three. Sorry. Um, It attacks modern people in order to cover, you know, you're grubbing around inside them to try to find their weaknesses, their sins, in order to exploit them, to to show them that they really do need God, that they're mistaken in their life. They really do need God. He calls that religious blackmail. Right. Right. So here's the quote here, uh, bottom of page 14. God becomes the answer to life's questions, a solution to life's needs and conflicts. So if anyone gives no evidence of such problems or refuses to lose self-control or be pitied over these things, then this person is really closed to talking about God Or else the man without such questions and so forth must have it proven to him that in truth he is up to his neck in such questions, needs, or conflicts without admitting it or knowing it. If we succeed here, existential philosophy and psychotherapy have worked out some very ingenious methods in this respect, then this man is open for God and Methodism, by which he meant the religious interpretation of Christianity, not the denomination, can celebrate its triumphs. But if people cannot successfully be made to regard their happiness as disastrous, their health as sickness, and their vitality as an object of despair, then the theologians are at their wit's end. Literally, their Latin comes to an end. (laughs) The person being dealt with either is a stubborn sinner of the most malignant kind or is living an existence of bourgeois self-satisfaction, and the one is as far from salvation as the other. We become judges. Let me, let me put forth a point. I know he's being on the outside here and it's whatever. Yeah. But as a pastor and as a church leader, I can tell you, you don't have to prick very deep beneath the skin that you're doing policy for people before you find the imperfections or the confusions. I've been hard pressed to get to, that anyone that I would actually get to know closely would leave this category of, of happy, healthy vitality. Every 
Yeah. Uh, I'd like to go back to the uh, sentence uh, right under uh, num number three. Uh, it says, when we take this approach, then uh, he says, the personal, the inner life, the private sphere, the intimate areas of our life from prayer to sexuality become the hunting ground of modern pastors. And so, Medals in these personal areas of your life in order to uncover your needs so we can apply the solution, right? Is mm -hmm. that what he's saying? And, and, and we see that in, in the evangelistic, uh, evangelical, the, the street preachers who stand on the street corner and shout at you as you walk by, do you have Jesus in your heart? And the first question that I would have is, why, is that a problem if I do or if I don't? I mean, and, and that's exactly what he's saying. It's, it's you have a problem. And then, well, okay, if I have a problem, well, what is it? Now we're, we're digging out what your issues are in life, and that, that's what's morally wrong, is, is, is yeah, in, that's invoking that's guilt. Awesome. We're not preaching the gospel. We're trying, we want to be like the Church of Victory in Homer that's got all those recovery alcoholics and kids, and, and uh, it's just predatory alcoholism, and that is not what but you're trying to do. Yeah, you're trying to find a bad conscience where there is none. Yes! No, no. He's happy. He was honored. He was blameless honored. as to the law. And then Jesus met him and his life turned to dust. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the kind of thing that Bonhoeffer must be getting He's at. He's getting at it. Let's go on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, he's he's getting at this. We'll we'll be getting at this as we as we move on here. But but you're anticipating, and that's good. Uh, well, you've read it uh, too ahead. So so, but he says the worst of all, this religious interpretation is a betrayal of Christ and the gospel because it confuses Christ with a particular stage of human religiousness, namely with a human law. Um, so it's not good news. It's a command to perform a religious act. Admit your needs, submit to God. And it's not only law, but a human invented law that only expresses one stage in human history. So, um, and we, we've talked about my question here, I think, uh, pretty extensively here. Um, the gospel um, always was the presence of Jesus Christ in his word and the sacraments as gift to lost and fallen people However, no one uh, can take uh, religion seriously and uh, persist in the religious approach. Uh, what did I, what? They, that's betrayal of Jesus Christ. If you take a religion seriously and persist in the religious approach. Too much editing there in that sentence, sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it substitutes law for gospel. Most basically, it's unchristian. So, on top of page 16, in the world come of age, a few people remain hopeful. Some people retain enough connection with the West Christian heritage, even unconsciously, to live responsibly and bear the suffering and guilt entailed in such a life. Bonhoeffer had many of his fellow conspirators in mind when he spoke of hopeful godlessness. But the majority sink into nothingness and lose any solid ground to stand on. When nothing is fixed and nothing holds us, then all moral boundaries fall and people fall prey to whatever momentary desire takes hold of them and they're easily swayed and led by whatever spirit is blowing. So there's no discipline, zucht. That's a very important word, zucht, discipline, zucht. Because modern autonomous people reject authority. How could there be discipline if there's no authority? The most common thing we see, I, I, uh, is uh, seminaries rejecting people for ordination. The most common thing that we Right. 
Discipline is essential for attaining freedom, for where freedom is taken to be self-assertion and emancipation from all authority, the way to real freedom is blocked. Instead, we have a so-called freedom that respects no boundaries. And this is expressed in a kind of seeing that is, quote, an intrusive, curious sort of seeing that analyzes and forces itself upon everything. It is a shameless seeing that requires that novels and films must follow their characters into the bedroom in order to see the most intimate parts of their lives. If he thought it was bad in the 1940s, what would he think now? <laughs> this is in contrast to the literature Bonhoeffer admired, Gotthelf, Jeremias Gotthelf, Adelbert Stifter, and others, and which he tried to emulate in his own fiction in which authors keep a respectful distance from their characters' inner lives, especially their intimate lives. The same kind of seeing is displayed in tabloid magazines that thrive on digging up dirt about celebrities. In his outline of his proposed book, Bonhoeffer has only the following, morals of the people, sexual morality as example. Um, the disintegration of sexual morality is a primary consequence of the descent into nothingness. With no authority and no discipline, chastity becomes meaningless, even ridiculous. And when chastity goes, then reason goes too. Listen to this quote, and let's, let's stop here and think about it. The essential thing about chastity is not a renunciation of pleasure, but an all-encompassing orientation of life toward a goal. Where there is no such orientation, chastity inevitably deteriorates into the ridiculous. Chaste living is the prerequisite for clear and superior thoughts. It's ridiculous to simply uh, try to enforce a sexual purity code for the sake of a sexual purity code, for the sake of being pure, right? Yeah. It is ridiculous. And the church often has done that and still does it and quite honestly deserves the ridicule it gets. You know, the, uh, what, the rings? Yep. Love can, uh, true love waits and all those things. And of course we know how hypocritical that often is. Um, and, uh, you know, where, where you kind of corral your teenagers and make them take an oath and a uh, pledge of uh, not having sex till marriage um, and then um, have, as some churches do, have support groups for young men uh, to keep them from having bad thoughts and doing things with themselves. Uh, you know... It, it becomes ridiculous because it's just taken, it's the, it's the error of the sexual revolution which makes sex a thing in itself and, and, a, and a goal in itself and, a, and, a, and an experience in itself and not as a means to an end, as one thing that's part of something bigger and a much bigger goal. Because as, as, as part of the life of following Jesus, sexual uh, chastity makes perfect sense. And it isn't something you obsess about. It's one thing among many things that, uh, is, um, is, is that, that, that God in his word leads us you know, to um, our spouse and gives us our spouse. And one part, and not by any means the biggest part of that, is the sexual relationship. Yeah, so uh, you would say something like uh, denial of pleasure for its own sake right. is as ridiculous, perhaps even more ridiculous than the pursuit of pleasure for its own sake. Right. And to deny people whatever kind of sex they want is ridiculous on the face of it if that's all people are seeing and that's all we're saying and that's all people are perceiving we're saying. It's ridiculous. So it's, it's, it's parodied, it's hooted out in the, in, in, in the stand-up by the stand-up comics and the, and the sitcoms and everywhere else. And we often deserve that. 
That's what he's saying. Because we have made it something that just stands on its own, and it doesn't. Right. Well, I think I think that the the best way is to is to talk about Jesus calling you, like I talked about yesterday, and say Jesus is calling you, and He is giving you these things, these relationships in your life, and uh, as part of your relationship, marriage is not where you go to get your needs met. It is not a private uh, relationship that you put together and contract for, for a mutual meeting of needs. It is a calling from God to serve another person. And part of the service you get, give in marriage is sexual. And that is serving your spouse. Okay, that turns everything upside down. And <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. Uh, and uh, it has nothing to do with your own fulfillment, nothing at all. Of yeah, course, it will fulfill you in the end. That's what really does fulfill. But, uh, but we have this deep, permeated idea that sex is something by itself, in and of itself, that it's something. It's not anything. It's just hormones and friction and then. And then what is that? That's... that's it is itself ridiculous, you know? And it's ridiculous, of course, to be, the, to be the slave of your own genitalia, right? I mean, what could be more degrading and inhuman? But anyway, um, that's very much to the point today, I think. And here's another one. One could add here another observation from the same page of aphorisms. Ultimate seriousness is never without a dose of humor. He's a German. I don't know of any humorous passages in any of his books. Some that make you smile a bit because you recognize yourself. But he understood humor. They have weird humor, but it's humor. Um, <laughs> Only those living a life disciplined to be truly human experience real humor. Because living in the tension of the old and new, the law and the gospel, sinner and saint, they are constantly aware of the chasm between the two. And precisely because they take God's new world seriously, they cannot take themselves seriously. And laughter is the mark of one who is both sinner and saint simultaneously. And it's not painful because we know the outcome. If, it were, if we had to live with this stark difference and it, were, it, it was finally a, a word of judgment against us, we couldn't laugh. <laughs> but uh, we can laugh. So how does that help us interpret the Bible?
Yeah. The passage that comes to mind is uh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And that is a two way street. Uh, what, what do I do that might give joy to the Lord? And the joy of his giving to me is just the two way prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or think of the parable of, of, of the uh, log in the eye and the speck in your neighbor's eye. The log in your eye. I mean, you, you can't help but smile at, at, at the ridiculousness of the image. And when you're smiling, that is, in a sense, your own death, isn't it? Because it is, it's just ridiculous because I see all those specks in all your eyes. And... And, and Jesus' word there just says, oh, wait a minute, how can you see? <laughs> you got a log in your own, you know. Uh, you just have to laugh at yourself. It just occurred to me that, um, that laughter may actually be a sign of true repentance. Yeah, way. yeah. Before we knew everything about him, yeah. His famous uh, trip to dentist routine. Yeah. And he's talking about, you know, all this. And why do we laugh? It's because I see myself in the dentist chair. Mm -hmm. And how ridiculous this whole thing is, mm -hmm. you know? And all my fears are exposed and all my discomfort is exposed, but it's not exposed in a way that humiliates me. It, it exposes Well, it's not your own experience just alone anymore. It's yeah. one that we share and we acknowledge. And that's how come we can laugh, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and you look at it in the context. I like the, the dentist chair, Bill Cosby example, because you can go with that. It, you know, in, in the context of law, that man is being assaulted. We should be angry. That's right. <laughs> And then, and we're, yeah. And so, I mean, it is, uh, it's ridiculous that uh, human beings made in the image of God, destined for, to rule the, the world, are, are, are sitting there with our mouth open and some guy is doing, you know, pounding away on our teeth or drilling away or whatever. I mean, this is, this is such an indignity. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I think that modern humor, humorists are, in, in, in general, not funny because, yep. because they, they, if, you, if you've got no human goal, human destiny, uh, or even any moral standard that what, bon, what, what Kierkegaard called the universal human that we are, that we are failing to attain and, and can see the contrast, the juxtaposition of these two our real condition and what we ought to be and can, as he said, put it into a context when it's not painful, then it's funny. Then we laugh at it. But if you have, if we're, if we are living, as I read from Bonhoeffer's quote here a little while back, you know, this nihilistic life, there's nothing there. There's, there's no basis for any laughter, not real laughter. It's just like someone was saying, if I can, a little bit of shock, maybe, and that's supposed to be funny, or using a bad word, or suddenly, uh, um, you know, it's humiliating, degrading of human beings, uh, mockery, uh, but not really, none of it rises to real humor. No. Yeah. Uh, occasionally they do. Uh, if you, if you remember on Saturday Night Live, if you remember the Coneheads, I always thought they were hilarious. The reason is because they're trying to fit in and they think they are, and they so obviously aren't. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, and that's what we're all trying to do. We're trying to fit in. <laughs> but, you know, and we all want to be part of the community, you know, and, uh, you know, what, and, and